sights on your right side? <laughs> Can you admire the sights a bit on your right side? Right, with uh, with the same driver. Right. Okay, that sounds good. All right, I think we have a plan. Please convey my apologies to uh, Ranga Krishna Prabhu and everyone, but it's kind of intense. Okay, thank you so much. A major, very important topic, a major idea in the Bhagavata Purana is bhakti. Bhakti is a Sanskrit word which we translate. Speaking with Dr. Nandita Krishna, who is the president of the C.P. Ramaswamy IR Foundation here in Chennai. Uh, she is a, a scholar of Indian art, art history, and her focus has been mainly on the study of Vishnu traditions. Uh, Vishnu is, of course, very important also in the Bhagavata Purana. And then there is the whole, whole what we may call, culture uh, of the Bhagavata. And what I think will be interesting is to hear from you something about that development of 
what we may call a Bhagavata culture surrounding the text of the Bhagavata Purana? Well, um, the Bhagavata, the word Bhagavata is mentioned in the Mahabharata as a synonym for Satvata, one of the Yadava tribes where uh, Krishna was born and they were worshippers of Bhagavan, Bhagavat, so on. But uh, we know that by the second century BC, a Greek messenger or minister of Antiochus, uh, who was an Indo-Greek king of Northwest India, Afghanistan, he came all the way to the kingdom of Bhagabhadra, the Shunga king, which was situated near modern Bhopal. And uh, there he puts up a Garuda Dvaja pillar, wh which he dedicates to his lord Vasudeva and says, I am a Bhagavata. So that is really the first time uh, historically that we come across somebody who claims to be a Bhagavata himself, which means that Bhagavatas must have been there long before him. Then of course it goes through a um, lot of literature and inscriptions and so on. But this is the first inscription really where we see a person calling himself a Bhagavata and he is a foreigner, visitor to the central Indian hinterland really. Mm. And uh, that means the cult of Bhagavata had been very widespread by that time. Now how did it spread and why did it move so fast? I think this was because of the beautiful stories that accompanied this cult of Bhagavata. And these are the stories which have been put together in the Bhagavata Purana, which probably belongs to any period between the 6th and the 8th century in its present form. But the stories would have been there much, much earlier because Krishna was there much earlier. The stories of Krishna's childhood, I mean they go back to the Mahabharata and so on. But there the main story is the two factions of the Kurus where Krishna is, all the adventures of Krishna are by the way. Mm. But uh, I think these have just been spreading around the Indian countryside, mothers telling their children. And so much of Indian culture is an oral tradition. So that has come down in such a way. Also, um, the Bhagavata lends itself a lot to the arts, to music, to dance and of course to painting and sculpture because the theme of uh, Krishna, the idea of Krishna and as a child, a very innocent child, you know, playing tricks on the gopis, on his mother, so beautiful. And then Krishna dancing with the gopis, I mean, is it just something sensuous or is it the coming together of so many jivas with Paramatma. By jiva, you mean? The individual soul. And Paramatma? The supreme soul, Brahman. So, we have to look beyond just a dance, a garbaras or something, and look at it as something deeply philosophical. And that is what the Bhagavata is trying to do at every point. It speaks of bhakti as a marga, as a bhakti or devotion, as a path to moksha or liberation. Um, as you know that there are three pathways which have been delineated so well by Adi Shankara. The Jnana Marga, the path of uh, wisdom, knowledge, the Bhakti Marga, pure devotion and Karma Marga which is uh, the path of action. And of these Bhakti is total surrender, sharanagati, mm. to a personal Lord. But then it does not separate you from the personal being because the Bhagavata Purana also talks about becoming one with Brahman. So it is not that the individual soul is separate from the Supreme Soul. It is the part of the Supreme Soul going back to the original Brahman. So I think this concept that everybody has a chance of liberation, of going back to the Supreme Being in a very simple way through bhakti, through, through music, through dance. You can just 
spend all your time singing bhajans to the Lord. And that is enough, that is enough is bhakti. And that also does not require great scholarship or great knowledge or anything. So the, it, I think that made it so simple. So I think that is, that accounts for the popularity of this movement, which did not require austerities and fasting and a lot of other things which are also very good and very good paths, but which may not be very easy to follow. And that popularity factor applies very much to today as well as in uh, the time of the Heliodorus column and yes. so on. A major topic of the Bhagavata Purana is how to cultivate our intrinsic natural feeling of devotion. Devotion for the supreme source of our being. And that, there's a term for this, it's bhakti. Bhakti is from a Sanskrit term which means to share. And the entire Bhagavata Purana is circling around this subject uh, to help us understand how, how we uh, can open up what the Bhagavata is trying to show is already potentially there uh, within our heart, within our consciousness. It presents this process as, as just that, as a process. Uh, and here, the technical word yoga is used. Yoga has a wide range of meanings. So bhakti yoga is uh, the technique, the practice, you can even say discipline, of cultivating our innate nature of devotion. And that devotion is, because it is innate, because it is, because it is natural, when it unfolds, when we learn, or rather when we remember what is already there in a dormant state, that brings about deep satisfaction. And so the Bhagavata Purana is returning again and again to this point. There's a very nice uh, statement toward the end of the Bhagavata which gives an interesting analogy. It says that when one is cultivating bhakti, it's like eating. When we eat, when we are hungry, uh, we take a meal, we don't have to ask someone else if we are getting nourished. We don't have to ask someone else if we're being satisfied. It says three other Sanskrit words, tushti, pushti, and kshutapaya. Uh, tushti means satisfaction, pushti means nourishment, and kshutapaya means the loss of hunger the reduction step by step of one's hunger with every bite of food. So in, 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 the, in the Bhagavatam, this is the kind of core message that's being developed. And it's being developed in many rich ways uh, through the portrayal of bhaktas, of devotees, of persons who cultivate bhakti or who have perfected the practice of bhakti and they are known either as bhaktas or in a sense in a higher level they're known as bhagavatas uh, and this is a kind of recurring theme we find throughout the text so many of the bhagavatas uh, some of them very young even children uh, show themselves to be exemplary, uh, persons who one can model one's life after. So this bhakti is essential, bhakti yoga, this is again a central idea of the Bhagavata Purana.
the Bhagavata seems, in some sense, there's an irony that it's an oral tradition, very much emphasis is on hearing, and there seems to be also so much emphasis on form, on rupa, and the idea of the beautiful character of, of the form of Vishnu, of Krishna. And of course that becomes rendered in painting. And this is your area of study, I believe. If you could say something about this connection of orality and, and, and uh, painting the art form, form, art form. Um, you know, the Bhagavata Purana appears in so many folk styles particularly. I mean, na classical styles will al already be very beautiful and, you know, they are all painters with great training. But even simple villagers who do Madhubani painting or some other villagers who do the Patachitra of Orissa and so many, Cherial. Cherial is a kind of a old, the forerunner to TV oh. where they had these big rolls, scrolls, scrolls oh, yeah, and yeah. they'd go on opening it and the story came out oh. and it was very elaborately painted by the painters and the story told. Now, in all this, beauty was very important because beauty, outer beauty is an, in, an indication of inner beauty. It's not that, you know, everybody has to go around looking like a glamorous film star. But, you know, we have a saying in Tamil, Ahati Narahi Muhati Le, that is, the, beaut the way you act creates the beauty in your face. I mean, you may we all know people who in a conventional sense are not beautiful, may even be on the ugly side, but yet they are full of laughter and love and we think, oh what a lovely face. We don't really sit down to dissect the nose and the ears and the eyes. And you'll find that the paintings of the Bhagavata Purana are like that. I mean, they are less on the individual beauty of the form as the beauty of the whole uh, composition as it were, you know, it has to be a unity, there has to be a unity and that has to create great pleasure. And I think that part is very important because if we look at something and we don't feel happiness, then it's not going to give you happiness. And even when a man selects a painting or a sculpture, the first thing he looks for is a very beautiful smiling face, it must smile. You know, he may be a Shaivite, a Vaishnavite, anything. Mm. But the face must be smiling and must be beautiful to the extent that the expression must be pleasing. And that is why you find that the Rakshasas, the demons, the Asuras all, are always, you know, mustachioed and pretty horrible looking fellows. <laughs> so there's that contrast between good and evil. Because don't forget the Bhagavata Purana being an oral tradition was probably just told by um, wandering minstrels, mothers to mothers to their children, minstrels to the common people about good, the superiority of good over evil and that you must attain that good. And to attain that goodness, you have to be good. So the emphasis on goodness is what I think is most important in the Bhagavata. So beauty uh, is, is together with, uh, what is it, truth, beauty, and what's the third principle? Anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, also in the Bhagavata it, it, images, I think the Tamil saying is the best. Ahati narahe muhati le. That means your actions are reflected in your face. And okay. if your actions are beautiful, yes. your face is beautiful yes, that's automatically. Amazing. <laughs> in the Bhagavata, there are descriptions of nature as well, and that seems to come into the uh, pictorial traditions. Yeah. Uh, would there be something you'd like to say about that in connection with this importance of uh, the, the image of pastoral well-being? Um, to start with, in the Indian tradition, every deity is connected with a tree, an animal and so on. Krishna is 
connected to the Kadamba tree. And, you know, in Krishna temples, you will always find, of course, the Tulsi in every home mm. is Krishna's spouse and the Kadamba tree in every temple. And uh, he was somebody who lived in Brindavan. And I don't know if you've been to Brindavan. It yes. is magical. Vrindavan is not just beautiful, it is magical. Mm. And the magic is the trees and the birds and I'm sure in Krishna's days there would have been a lot more wildlife than there is today. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks so beautiful, the atmosphere, you know, it's like going to any beautiful place and getting carried away. Mm. So I think uh, the beauty of the Vraj forests, there are 12 forests associated with the story of Krishna in the Bhagavata Purana. So the beauty of Braj uh, and the beauty of the trees, the plants, all that comes into the painting and especially in the paintings of Orissa, mm. you know, where you have Jayadeva's Gita Govinda, which is a mm. celebration of beauty itself. And uh, there you find beautiful, not very realistic, but very beautiful symbol, symbol symbolically painted plants and leaves and flowers. I mean, the leaf may not be green, it may be red, it may be pink. <laughs> yes. That's okay, but yeah. it's a beautiful plant and that's what matters. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Krishna is associated with the Kadamba tree. He's certainly also very much associated with cows. Yes. And the cows also get represented in painting, isn't it? Yes, very much so. Uh, I did this book, well I've done two books, one on sacred plants of India and another on sacred animals of India. I just recently got your book on sacred animals. Sacred animals, okay. And uh, when I was researching it, the sanctity of the cow precedes the story of Krishna. But I'm quite convinced that the whole cult of the cow, the sacred cow, really developed with Krishna. Mm -hmm. because. He tells the cowherds that uh, don't worship Indra, worship the trees and the mountain Govardhana and the cows which give us milk. And he's, he's very loving towards his cows. And mm -hmm. I think that with the spread of the Krishna worship, the uh, importance of the cow also develops in time. Dr. Nandita, can you please tell us who is Krishna? Well, what we know of Krishna is that he is one of the incarnations of Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu Narayana, who appears first in the Rig Veda. He is born to Kamsa, the evil, wicked king of Mathura, to his sister, sorry, to Kamsa's sister Devaki and her husband Vasudeva as their eighth son, born to kill this very wicked uncle of his. And the store, and but as a child, he's spirited away to be brought up by a foster mother and father, and he grows up till he comes and kills this uncle. So that is the conventional story. But uh, Krishna is more than just one incarnation because Krishna uh, combines in himself many things. He is a child, and a, as a child, he is a child god. He is a child god of the Abhiras, the Ahit tribe and uh, the Vrishnis, as they are called, who lived around the Mathura region. And then he is also a politician par excellence. <laughs> you know, he is trying to put, uh, prevent the war, the great Kurukshetra war, which was so devastating and where the Kuru, uh, Kurus destroyed each other in the bargain, he tries to prevent it. Krishna is also the founder of Dwarka. When he finds that Magadha is attacking his people again and again, he goes west to what is now Gujarat and there he founds the uh, city of Dwarka. So that is yet another Krishna. But you also have the Krishna who is the author of the Bhagavad Gita, which is probably the saram of the Upanishads, that is, Sara means the juice of the Upanishads. It takes the best of the Upanishads because the Upanishads are very difficult to understand. As one who has read them, I know I have to read them many times to understand every line. 
but uh, he has taken it and very put it into very simple language which anyone can follow so that is krishna the philosopher so can you imagine what a fantastic being he must have been you know one point he is a child god he is a politician he is a creator of a new city of someone who finds founds a new city uh, he is a great philosopher and i think that is the most important aspect of krishna the philosopher krishna devaki putra who is the author of the bhagavad gita mm -hmm. and that is why i think you know when arjuna says when he sees when he sees krishna suddenly he sees this vishwarupa you know he sees the whole world the whole universe so much within krishna and i think all these various dreams that we are talking about he sees arjuna sees in this vishwarupam which is krishna so i don't know if that explains to you who is krishna <laughs> but uh, that is how i see krishna one of the important principles we find in the shrimad bhagavata purana is the notion of avatara uh, avatara literally means this that which crosses down crossing down or descending uh, the idea is that uh, the supreme person the supreme godhead uh, the supreme source of all being exists beyond this world entirely and he can appear in this world at his will the bhagavata gives account of several avatars so it lists uh two or three times uh 22 different avatars in one case more in another case and it describes what these avatars do when they appear in the world Uh, there is a general purpose of the avatar which is to re-establish the process by which human beings can become spiritually elevated in other words these avatars uh present uh they clarify what becomes very confused uh especially in the present age uh known as the age of kali the age of quarrel the age of sometimes said hypocrisy the age of general degradation uh one of the big problems of human life today the bhagavata says is we don't know what we're doing we don't know what is the purpose of our lives so the avatars are coming to clarify this in so many different ways in very interesting and fascinating ways uh and the source of all of these avatars the bhagavata tells us is krishna uh the sanskrit verse ate changsa kalapungsa krishna's two bhagavan svayam there are many different forms that descend that cross down into the world but of all of these uh krishna is the original the 10th canto of the bhagavata purana is probably the most important because it's full of the stories of of the child krishna and uh these are the stories which come in upanyasam and harikatha harikatha is a very beautiful uh, tradition where you have these musicians who sing very well and they go around um, narrating the story of krishna from village to village of course now they are all in concerts and so on yeah. but traditionally they went from village to village singing and you'll be interested to know you know the word bhagavata has come to actually mean a musician in south india oh. because in the uh, vijayanagar empire you had these bhagavatars they were basically telugu smarta now it's interesting that unlike a lot of other texts 
the Bhagavata Purana is not sectarian. It is not restricted to Vaishnavas because Smarthas follow it equally. And uh, these are Telugu Smarthas. Mm. Smarthas are followers of the Smritis. And uh, they used to sing and dance about the Bhagavata Purana. Mm. And then when of course the Vijayanagar kingdom was destroyed by the Muslim kingdoms, Bhamani kingdoms of uh, central India, all these uh, Bhagavatars came to a village called near Kumbakonam called Melatur. Mm. And they once a year in the month of Dhanus, that is between uh, December 15 and January 15, in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says of the months, I am mm. Dhanu. So they perform the Bhagavata Mela and it is all the stories of the 10th canto, the 10th book of the Bhagavata Purana. Mm. And because of this tradition, musicians are called Bhagavatars in South India. Oh, okay. Or anybody like my music master was known as Shankara Bhagavatar. Mm. Though he was not a singer of Bhagavata Purana necessarily, he was mm. a classical musician. Mm. But they are known as Bhagavatars, singers basically singers of uh, musicians yeah. so they the it's come to that tradition one of the episodes in the 10th book uh, of very young krishna <coughs> mm -hmm. is when his foster mother yashoda is told by krishna's brother balaram or balabhadra that krishna has eaten dirt she says, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Can you say something about what happens? Yes, she says, happens? open your mouth. Uh, Balabhadra comes and tells Yashoda that uh, Krishna has eaten dirt. And like any other mother, she goes very angrily and says, I believe you ate dirt. So open your mouth. And he opens his mouth and she sees the whole world. I think that's symbolic of two things, you know. Uh, one is, of course, that Krishna being the supreme being has the whole world in his mouth itself but it's also that dirt is not just mud and dirt mm. it is mother earth it is the earth from whom we all have birth mm. so i think it's to show also the sanctity mm. that you know it's not just dirt and mud and all that he has yeah. in his mouth it is the world itself it is something mm. sacred which could be a kind of message for environmentalism. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of environmentalism, I always think of uh, the story of Kaliya Damana, mm -hmm. when Krishna subdues uh, this multi-headed uh, serpent who is poisoning the Yamuna. <laughs> That's happening today. It's very much <laughs> happening today, so it seems to be a message very relevant. Very relevant today. and there doesn't seem to be any Krishna coming along today. That's the tragedy. <laughs> Perhaps there needs to be more awareness of the message of the Bhagavata. I think people have stopped connecting it. And this is where I think the oral tradition is so important. Mm. Um, you know, when you read the Bhagavata Purana, if I read it, okay, you know, Krishna destroys the... Uh, serpent Kaliya and then he goes away with his wife and lives elsewhere. But when, you know, somebody says it, when they tell the story, that is when they have the chance to say that he, that right. the poison from Kaliya represents the pollution. Mm. Now that is not there, written there in the text. Right, right. So I think Some oral traditions so. matter very much because whether yeah. it's a mother telling her child or a singer or a somebody who's doing an upanyasa telling his um, listeners that this is what it means you need somebody to tell you i mean everybody right. does yeah. not make the yeah. automatic that deduction yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course there's the rasa dance uh, which uh, is is very central to some of the uh, Krishna worship traditions, especially I'm thinking the Chaitanya tradition, the, the Rasa Leela is considered central to that. Would you like to say anything on that topic? Yeah, I think, you know, it's because music and dance mm -hmm. are central to celebration, mm. the celebration of life. 
and the beauty of life. But then finally you also uh, dance to a point, you release yourself and finally it becomes a chance to become one with the with Brahman himself. So I think we should stop seeing Rasa, Ras Leela as two people banging sticks and dancing. Mm. Because if you see the tempo increases mm. and the tempo increases so that at a certain point you stop seeing whether you should do one, two, three, four or move your feet this way or move, you know, in some other way. And uh, you give yourself up. When you do the Ras Leela, when you do the Garba, you give yourself up to the dance. And when you give yourself up to the dance, you also give yourself up to Krishna. The other person doesn't matter. That is why it's never one person, you know, not like say a waltz where you're just twirling around the room with one person. Then you're mm. very aware of the other person. Here the other person doesn't matter. It could be a man, it could be a woman, it could be anybody. You keep on going round and round and, you know, you are um, merging yourself with something very divine. And I think that is the message that the Ras Leela is giving. That is why it's not restricted to two people uh, just, uh, you know, cling, uh, just hitting their sticks with each other. The, as I said, you know, you go around with a circle of 20 people, 40 people, any number, 100 people. It doesn't matter. Mm. It's but in this case, it's very much Krishna. It's Krishna. Everyone center. becomes Krishna. The, the other person is Krishna. And you are giving yourself up to Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>